You see, the journey of faith began with Abraham. But the journey of faith did not end with Abraham. The journey of faith ended with Christ. If you study Romans chapter 4 verse 1, Paul said, What did our father Abraham, according to the flesh, found? Because he was the one who discovered the way of faith. So the journey of faith began with Abraham. And the elders followed after that order until Christ came. And so there are two dimensions of faith. There is the Abrahamic dimension of faith. And there is the dimension of faith that Christ modeled. That's what you call the faith of the Son of God. Both of them are relevant in our lives today. And I will tell you why they are relevant. Without the Abrahamic faith, you cannot be introduced into the economy of salvation. And if you are not introduced into the economy of salvation, you cannot receive the faith of Christ. And so we begin with the Abrahamic faith, but ultimately we end with the faith of the Son of God. In the Abrahamic order of faith, you believe in God so that God will intervene. And I tell you, until the end of our journey, we will keep walking like that. The Bible said, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. He said, they staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief. He was strong in faith, giving thanks to God. So, the Abrahamic order of faith is to put your trust in God. Every believer must have that faith and must begin from there. But when you come into Christ, you discover another higher realm of faith. And that's why I was explaining to you about the designer of a robot. When the robot designer designs the robot, he expects that once in a while, you will call him to come and intervene. Because the robot can break down, the robot can be overworked, and the programming can go wrong. So once in a while, you will need to call on the designer to come and intervene. But the designer does not expect you to call him every day. Because there is something the designer put inside the robot that makes the robot able to represent him without him necessarily come there, coming there. And so God does not expect us to always call him to come to the scene. There is something God has put in us that God knows is able to represent him even though he is physically absent. That when men see that, it will direct men to him. Are you following? That is the God kind of faith. Why Abraham and the fathers of old believed in God? The faith that we now receive after believing in God is not just to trust in God. The faith we now have is the God kind of faith. Is the faith of God himself. So it's just, if you operate the God kind of faith and you are looking at God to come and intervene, it's just like God wanting to do something and God is waiting on himself. Because in Romans chapter 12 verse 3, the Bible said, unto every one of us, he dealt the measure of faith. And Peter called it the God kind of faith. Paul called it the faith of the Son of God. What is the faith of the Son of God? The faith of the Son of God is not just your ability to trust in God. The faith of the Son of God is your awareness that everything you need for life and godliness is already in you. So you don't look up to God to answer anymore. You confront the mountain because when you come, God comes. When you show up, God shows up. When you speak, God speaks. So you are not waiting on God to come and intervene. When you come, you become the embodiment of God's intervention. And that was the faith Jesus taught in Mark 11. He said, have the God kind of faith. From Mark 11, 22. He said, when you are confronted with a mountain, he said, don't trust in God. Don't call upon the name of the Lord. Don't invite God into the scene. He said, when you are confronted with a mountain, believe that there is something in you that can move that mountain. He said, so what do you do? Don't call on God into the matter. He said, you speak to the mountain. Tell the mountain, be thou removed. Be thou cast away. And if you do not doubt in your heart, he said, you shall have whatsoever you say. And so in the journey of faith, we begin by trusting in God and we will keep trusting in God. But as we grow in faith, we keep coming to a level where the God that is on our inside also begins to manifest. And so when we are confronted with an issue, we don't say, Lord, show up. We tell that issue, get out. Because we have come. God has come. When we manifest, that is God's intervention. 
And so when there is a crisis, if you step into the crisis, God has stepped into the crisis. You know why? Because at this level of faith, you and God becomes inseparable. You and God becomes indivisible. So when you show up, God shows up. When you speak, God speaks. When you appear, God appears. When you touch, God touch. Because you have become one with Him. It's a dimension of faith. But the reason you are able to manifest that faith is because now you have the life of God and the Spirit of God that is in you has made you one with God. It's a Him that is joined to the Lord. Is one spirit with Him. See the problem we have. Religion has marginalized Christians by over-exaggerating the need to call upon God. And so there are Christians who every day of their life, they are calling God to intervene. They wake up, they are calling on God to intervene. They are sleeping, they are calling on God to intervene. If God needs to live here, why did Jesus go to heaven? He said, who has believed our report? Unto whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? And he said in verse 8, who shall declare his generation? God wants to sit in heaven. Why you go there to represent him? And so what God is looking for when you come back is praise, is honor, is thanksgiving, is exhortation. Because when he sent you there, you became his representative. Imagine if the president sends Apostle Salvation to this meeting. And Apostle Salvation now comes here. Instead of him to do what the president needs to do, he now stands here and starts leading us to pray to invite the president. The question is, why were you sent? If you need to see invite the president, then why were you sent? It's because the president doesn't want to come bodily. That's why he sent you bodily to become his bodily representation to a generation. If you know this, certain scriptures will come alive. In Luke 10, 16, he said, if they hear you, they hear me. And so when people want to hear God, you start talking. Did you not read about Paul? Paul was speaking in 1 Corinthians 7. He said, concerning virgins, I have no commandment from the Lord. God didn't speak. He said, but I have been found to be trustworthy. And he said, so I will speak on this matter. And the things Paul said, without the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, became equal with scriptures. The Bible said the scripture is the breath of God. How can a man speak without the inspiration of God and it's equivalent to scripture? He understands faith. That when they hear me, they hear God. When I talk, God talks. It's a level of maturity that believers must get into. If you know that, even when you shake people, you are imparting them. Impartation is not for people to kneel down and you are religiously laying your hands on them. Jesus didn't tell us people must kneel down for us to lay our hands. He said, touch them. When you touch anybody, you have imparted the person. And so in the word of faith, there is no such thing as handshake. In the word of faith, when you shake somebody, you have imparted it. Everything about contact in the realm of faith is transmission of divine possibilities. Because when you touch them, God touches them. That's Christianity. These things, we don't understand them. That's why we do much rituals, much religion, and yet we have no result. He said, you have made the word of God of none effect by your tradition. When you receive eternal life, God fleshed himself over you. When they see you, they see him. When they hear you, they hear him. But what is your consciousness? What do you understand? You know what the Bible calls carnality? It's not a sin. Carnality is not a sin. To be carnally minded is not a sin. It's death. It didn't say it's a sin. You know what to be carnally minded is? To be conscious of your physical and human dimension. And not to be conscious of your divine dimension. To be conscious of the world that you are physically in and not to be conscious of the world where you came from. A spiritual man is a man who is conscious of his divine side more than he is conscious of his physical side. A spiritual man is a man who is conscious of the world where he came from more than the world that is living in. That's why Paul said we are pilgrims on the face of the earth. He said we are ambassadors in the earth realm. We don't belong here. We were sent here for a purpose. When you start becoming spiritual, you will become more conscious of your divine side than your natural side. And that's why I was telling you yesterday, many people spend all the time on giving, on cutting their hair, on enlarging their body part. They are carnal. They are joining in the direction of death. 
There's nothing wrong in looking clean and excellent. There's nothing wrong in spending time to upgrade your physique is necessary. But if that is where your greatest energy goes to, you are carnally minded. You say your path is there. But there is a spiritual man who knows that his hand is an instrument of healing. His voice is an instrument of divine direction. His feet is a means of bringing glad tidings. Everything about him, there's a spiritual connotation to it. You can never walk in the supernatural until you know what you carry. Faith is actually the awareness that the ability of God is in you and is working. It's not just trusting in God. Yes, it begins with trusting in God. But that your trust in God has brought you somewhere. It has brought you to a place where God has put his ability in you. And so faith now is your awareness, your understanding that the ability of God is in you and it is working. This does not make you independent of God. This rather makes you more grateful to God. Because God has put everything you need in you and has allowed you to manifest. My son today has my ability. But he cannot believe, he can't begin from there. Everything about my DNA is in him. But at this level, he's a child. He's still at the Abrahamic order. He needs me to wake him up. He needs me to feed him. In fact, sometimes when he sleeps for six hours, the mom will wake him up and feed him. He'll be sleeping and eating. And he will eat sleeping. He will not be aware. He will not sleep again. Because the mother knows that after six hours, he'll be hungry. He didn't ask for food though. But even the parents know that he depends on his parents for everything. He doesn't even know he should go to school. Three days ago, we put him in school. If you, if you take him to school, he will be crying. He wants to stay with his father. If I'm going out, he will run and grab me. He depends on me for everything. But a day will come when he will grow up. If he doesn't get his food and he calls me, I'll say, what's wrong with you? You don't need me to give you food. Go and look for food. I'll put something on your inside. That's why sometimes when you start growing, the more you trust in God, the less answer you will get. You know why? You have grown up. So God expects you to start putting the ability in you to work. You have been a Christian for 15 years. You say we are trusting God. We are believing God. What is that? That's a language for babes. Imagine if my son becomes 30 years old and then he will now come here and say, Dad, I need lunch. Are you okay? If you need lunch, go and work with your hand. Make money and eat lunch. What is lunch? Hey, Dad, I need clothes. What do you mean by clothes? They sell clothes in the market. Take your money, go and buy. I put something in you. When he said, child, if he needs clothes, I will provide. If he needs food, I will provide. So it will be right for him to trust me, to depend on me. But when he grows up, I now trust him. I depend on him to use the ability that I put on his life. 